Today's video is a dive down the rabbit hole of electroculture and a little bit about the colorful characters we met along the way. In the little house where the pixies are growing, imagination, as a commodity, has never been in short supply. So when I suggested we expand our already successful electroculture trial into a more purposeful pursuit of understanding, the Pixies and their siblings simply convened a meeting and surrounded by their books, computers, notepads and a snack, and a few pots of tea, set to work investigating. The introduction of the subject of electroculture into the Pixies' protégère had already led us down a spiraling rabbit hole with seemingly no inclination to end anytime soon. The more we researched, explored, and tested our ideas on our leafy folk, the more excited we became at the results and the possibilities. And the more we questioned things, the deeper the hole we had inadvertently fallen into became. What if what we thought we knew about the world was not the full story, we pondered. What if we've all been so jaded and overwhelmed by the rapid progression of technology and discovery in our own lifetime that we have little imagination left for the limitless possibilities left undiscovered, or for innovation, observation, and exploration without the boundaries of preconceived notions. Suppose, we theorized, the only thing standing between us and dislodging our entrenched paradigms is our thinking we already know the answers, and our unwillingness to experiment with something that makes us seem odd to others or appears to be too elementary in its execution. We can't know what we don't know, and if our innate curiosity is drowned out by the pursuit of things, the daily burdens of life in an intensely noisy, fast-paced world, or the fear of others' disapproval, we simply don't even have the inclination or the energy to ask the questions. But what if this crazy rabbit hole we've toppled into, like Alice's romp through Wonderland, transforms us each into a different person than we were yesterday, wouldn't our future be that much more intriguing? The Pixies agreed that being a new person did sound interesting, with the caveat that there would be snacks and copious amounts of tea diluted with cream for this future version of themselves to partake of. Anything less would be intolerable and teeter dangerously on the brink of uncivilized. On this, we could all agree. It turns out that there was nothing dry or disinteresting about this rabbit hole. Electroculture may be the harnessing of atmospheric energy and the electromagnetism of the Earth through the use of simple tools such as magnets and antennas made of copper, aluminum, brass, and the like to help increase the health and productivity of plants through frequencies, the stimulation of microbial activity, and the enrichment of the soil. But there is much more to this story than a simple definition. The Victorian era set the stage for staggering advances in technology, industry, and exploration. Beneath the rule of their new and very young monarch, Victorians embraced emotional aesthetics and the pursuit of intellectual improvement, all scored to the thrilling refrains of Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, and Wagner. The spark of imagination leapt to life as if it had been set to dry tinder and roared across the social consciousness of Europe and Britain, reaching into the farthest corners of the known world with its untethered idealism. William Blake opined that great things are done when men and mountains meet, while Alfred Lord Tennyson advised his contemporaries, "'Twas better to have loved and lost than never have loved at all." And Robert Browning pondered, "'Why stay on earth except to grow?' Daring to do was the theme of this golden era. Adventurers, both male and female, decked themselves out in attire that would make steampunk enthusiasts of the future swoon in begoggled delight and explore the globe with the intent of identifying and classifying the mysteries of their world. They climbed mountains in Tibet, crossed the Sahara Desert discovering the fabled city of Timbuktu, and headed out for a quick explore of Africa after tea, forgetting to leave a forwarding address and prompting Stanley's now infamous line, Dr. Livingston, I presume, when the wayward doctor was discovered after seven years believed dead. A Frenchman invented photography. Samuel Morse created the telegraph. Alexander Graham Bell patented the telephone, and then he called a friend. 
The development of the steamships increased international trade and opened up movement across the globe and railroads crisscrossed the landscape as the engine of industry and travel hit new dizzying speeds. Writers imagined worlds with significant social improvement, adventures lurking around every corner, and supposed that men might someday walk about completely undetectable to others, that they would find pristine ancient biospheres deep within the center of the earth or dive 20,000 leagues beneath the fathomless sea. Into this rapidly changing world, brimming with limitless possibilities and fearless innovators, was quietly born a wave of unorthodox thinkers whose imaginations were primed by the previous era and formed by their individual fascination with observing nature. Tesla, with his extravagant view of the cosmos, his passion for wireless energy, his invention of the radio, and his development of alternating current, stands beside Marconi, an Italian physicist with his lifelong work on radio waves and electromagnetism, having often been labeled as the inventor of the radio himself. There was Royal Raymond Reif, an American inventor, known for his microscopes which defied the known parameters of magnification for his time, and who used electromagnetic frequencies to kill cancer cells through the use of radio waves. His work was highly touted by the medical field and scientific journals of his day, until the AMA and the ACS later rejected his well-documented work and jailed anyone using his machine for curing anything. Victor Schauberger was an Austrian naturalist and inventor who was struck by the repetition of vortexes and spirals throughout nature and connected it to reflect a universal energetic movement, becoming convinced that contracting vortexes created bioenergy in flowing water. His inventions primarily revolved around water, its movement and management and ways that restored its natural vitality and the land that it affected. He also began working with copper and brass in agriculture, developing a special type of plow which turned the soil in a vortex, energizing the soil as it cut through the earth. And then there was George Lukowski, an electrical engineer and the inventor of the multi-wave oscillator, who discovered that all living cells, whether they be plants, humans, bacteria, etc., are electromagnetic resonators, which are capable of receiving and emitting oscillations of their own distinct high resonant frequencies. His research established that a cell subject to an oscillating frequency the same as its own would be strengthened and become more vigorous, while a cell that was exposed to a frequency not similar to its own would be weakened and lose vigor. He observed that the cells of disease-causing organisms produced frequencies different from those of a healthy cell in a human, plant, or animal and that by increasing the amplitude, but not the frequency, of a healthy cell's oscillation, he could overcome the effects of the disease-causing cells, oscillation, and restore the targeted cells to their healthy state. If he in turn amplified the disease-causing oscillation, the disease would become more aggressive and overtake the healthy cell. In 1924, Lukowski experimented with tin geranium plants in an attempt to prove his aforementioned theory he inoculated 10 geranium plants with a plant disease which caused cancerous tumors in all the geraniums within 30 days. Once the tumors were established, he fashioned and suspended an open 12 inch in diameter copper coil from an ebonite stake and placed the open loop around the stem of one of the geraniums. The copper loop acted as an antenna with the specific diameter of the loop capturing high frequencies which were collected and concentrated from cosmic rays and which would resonate within the cell's own frequency range. This in turn would cause the captured energy to reinforce the cell's own resonant oscillation being naturally produced by the cell's nucleus. After 30 days, nine of the cancerous geraniums died from the disease, while the geranium with the copper coil shed the tumors within three weeks and was thriving by the second month. Three years later, with the original coil still in place, the geranium was a large and healthy, thriving plant. Lukowski was able to replicate this result in both humans and animals in future experiments, and developed copper wire loops that could be worn as bracelets or around other parts of the body to invigorate the cellular function of the wearer, as well as to increase the immune responses of the cells. 
Through his work, Lakovsky showed that cells vibrate under the influence of cosmic, telluric, and atmospheric electromagnetic waves, and that all cells draw their energy from the field of secondary radiation, occurring when cosmic rays bombard the Earth and atoms receive a positive or negative charge dependent on the geological makeup of a particular place. While his primary emphasis was on the healing of human disease, his discoveries and research successes ignited the imagination of those working to improve the health and production of their plants as well. Finally, at least for this overview, there was the brilliant and eccentric Pier Luigi Igina, an Italian researcher known as the Man of the Clouds and who developed the theory of the magnetic atom. He believed that spiraling waves of the magnetic atoms were constantly exchanged between the Sun and the Earth. His understanding of electromagnetism got the attention of Marconi, the inventor of the radio telegraphy, and he proceeded to work as his assistant until Marconi's untimely death. He firmly believed knowledge is a common good and everyone should use it, and therefore never patented any of his inventions. He was, however, a prolific inventor and a brilliant theorist. His earthquake valves work by dampening the energy generated by seismic events wherever they are placed and have been installed around Italy with great success. He invented machines capable of changing the weather or transforming matter, healing cells and capturing the ether energy all around us and directing it. Egina's work with spirals of differently colored wires and aluminum combined the electromagnetism with the use of the color spectrum and frequencies of solar radiation. His demonstrations of his stroboscope, which could repel or attract clouds depending upon which way it was turned, astounded onlookers and gained him some notoriety. But the most delightful anecdote concerning Agena had to do with his annoyance with the Grand Prix which was held every Sunday next to his home in Amola. His form of protest against this disturbance was to simply turn his machine and make it rain every Sunday. With rumor having it that those involved with the Grand Prix eventually approached him and asked him to please stop his particular form of protest, Egina's theories make the broader scientific community's hair stand on end, and not just because of his position on electromagnetism. Perhaps his most startling claim was that the Earth's core is not solid at all, but rather a sun-like plasma that our sun and the Earth's core reverberate with identical heartbeats an idea which causes eyes to roll amongst consensus of science. This disapproval from his peers did not faze Agena in the least, since he thought being dismissed as crazy was his most freeing attribute. He sought no monetary backing for his experiments, so he would be answerable to no capitalistic force, as he only cared that what he was learning and experimenting with could be proven and used for the greater good of humanity. His use of metal spirals to capture both solar energy and electromagnetic energy of the Earth is being experimented with more and more by electroculture enthusiasts around the world with exciting results. And quietly, his earthquake dampeners are being installed by governments around the globe in earthquake-prone areas. Consensus is often the death of scientific advancement as it prevents the questions from being asked and intimidates those who would otherwise contradict the accepted norms. All of these men, and more, who have not been mentioned here, refused to be hemmed in by the commonly known scientific explanations of their day and created waves which continue to ripple out into the future. They have often been maligned and dismissed or worse, and yet, as technological advances catch up to these men who were ahead of their time, we can see many of their theories and inventions being embraced and utilized in our everyday lives. Obviously, this is merely an overview of the discoveries of these brilliant men, and I recommend if you would like to know more about each one of them, that you seek out their stories in their own words, as most have written books, research papers, and articles, and some have even given interviews to the media. However, you may need an interpreter to watch the interviews if you do not know or speak fluent French or Italian, which we sadly do not. The Pixies are currently working on learning French, but when I suggested they interpret for us, there was a momentary panic and a few nervous giggles, so we stuck to the already interpreted version. After entirely too much tea, and more information than our exhausted brains could hold at once, we turned to the business of implementing the ideas we'd just learned and incorporating them into our protégé. 
And while all this information was definitely enlightening, the doing was much more so. And we look forward to sharing that with you in part two of this longer than anticipated production. Thank you for watching and please consider liking and subscribing to our channel as it helps us to continue to grow. See you next time. Comprehending copy Natal, Victor Selbogel. I think it would have been much better if Noon had contemplated how the apple got up there in the first place. Victor Schauberger.